So, Corey, thanks for joining us. Uh, you recently published, on behalf of the Electronic Frontier Foundation, what some people would say is a radical plan for a blanket music license for the internet. Um, first of all, before you sort of explain how it works, why is this needed now? It doesn't take an economics genius to understand that when sellers are selling into a market with just a few buyers, right, when there are just a few intermediaries that, that control it, that what those, uh, what those intermediaries do is they increase the share of the income that they retain in the industry. And what we did was we looked back at how other media had coped with this. What we did when the first phonograms came along, what we did when the first broadcasts came along, what we did when it was possible to play music in a commercial establishment. Uh, and, and what you find is that to varying degrees, we dispense with the negotiation, right, where the DJ in the club calls up the artist before they drop the needle and asks whether it's going to be 50p or two pounds to play this track. And we also dispense with the right to, to exclude or prohibit, right? We don't say to Paul Anka, we understand that you don't like Sid Vicious singing my way, so you're not, you will stop him from doing so. And instead, we just say, you have the right to get paid. You have the right to get paid. We'll create some kind of institution to pay you. But we're going to take the transaction cost of deciding who can perform out of it. They said, well, like, there are systems like that for the internet. They're weak costs. They were diluted. They were never well implemented. But that doesn't mean that we couldn't do it. I mean, that's how we got radio stations and hairdressers and nightclubs and all of the other places where people pay for and listen to music without those negotiations. We said, well, why not something like that for the internet as well? Why hasn't that happened before for the internet? And how would it be fundamentally different structurally? Music companies, uh, at whatever level they existed, sheet music publishers, recording uh, studios uh, and labels, um, broadcasters and so on, each layer of the value chain has liked the fact that they could procure raw material on a blanket license basis, but didn't like the fact that their transformed version of it was also available on that blanket license business. They wanted to, to get stuff in a sure and reliable way, but they wanted to sell it at auction because they understood that they could get a high bidder who might in the short term pay them more. There's a problem with auctions though, which is that um, eventually all the low bidders are forced out of business. And then the high bidders don't have to bid against each other quite so hard. But how would a blanket license work? Because you've, you've described it as something that you talked about monopolies there. You said it's something that promotes competition, which is good for, from a business perspective. And from an artist perspective, it's almost, you said, a license to print money. Um, that sounds really good. So how would that work? And, sure. and the bigger question is, what needs to happen to make that a reality? Great. Well, uh, you know, it is easy to put into a soundbite if you elide a lot of details. So let me start by eliding a bunch of details, and then maybe we can drill into some of the details. Here's the way it works. Um, if you want to start an online service that does what the services that currently license music do, whether that's Spotify, YouTube, TikTok, or what have you, you go to a collecting society, and you pay them a license fee based on the number of users you have. Uh, and that goes up and down as your users come and go. And the collecting society uses statistical sampling to figure out how music is being used on your platform. And they take the money that you have paid on behalf of your users and they give it to the artist. And half of the money goes directly to the artist, irrespective of their contractual arrangements with their labels. So even if the label says 100% of this collecting society money goes to Universal, Universal can't touch half of the money. Half of the money goes straight into the artist's pocket. That's the top level version, right? Every time someone wants to do something cool with music, they pay. They get to use the music, their users get to use the music, the artists get paid, and they get paid even if they've been corralled into a terrible contract that says that they have to recoup or some other thing has to happen before they start seeing a, uh, a dime. Apart from artists who I think would enjoy that, why would anyone else agree to do that? Why, you mean why would the labels agree to do it or yeah. why would anyone else agree to oh, yeah, sorry. So, mean, yeah, so why, why yeah. would labels agree to do that? I mean, users would like to do it for sure. Uh, as would as would people who want to start services. Um, why would why would the labels agree to do it? I don't think they would, uh, or, or at least I don't think they will willingly. I think that they're probably going to have to be drag kicking and screaming to it. But if you look at the proposals that have passed that have done so little to improve the fortunes of artists, 
like the copyright directive in Europe, um, or or the previous copyright directive in 2001, uh, the EUCD that, that created the stricture on removing DRM and so on. In some cases, those rules have succeeded in transferring a few points from the balance sheet of a concentrated big tech industry to the balance sheet of a concentrated entertainment industry. But very few crumbs have landed on the tables of artists or, or of audiences, right? There, there weren't many dividends for anyone except for a group of giant companies and their investors, a small group of giant companies and their investors. And right, so you have the artist groups who wrongly believed that if they made the investors in their work richer, that the investors would share with them. And I think that if you offer artists a more direct way to get paid, right? If you if you just jump clear of this ridiculous notion that the only way we can hope to help artists is to help the firms that have historically exploited artists and hope they have a, a you know a, a Christmas morning miracle where they change their minds and decide that rather than putting those extra monies into executive compensation and uh, and and shareholder dividends that they'll just up their royalty rates that will move artists onto the side where artists belong, which is on the side of our audiences and on the side of free expression. Um, we've gone through the whole conversation without even mentioning the blockchain, which is an achievement in itself. Um, uh, but the technology exists. The, the will is there from many sides of the industry to change this. But will change happen? And how, how will that change happen in, in, sort of a, in, in terms of progress? So this plan has a lot of uh, big empty spaces in it, right? Uh, empty spaces that have never been satisfactorily filled. Like, what does a collecting society look like if it's fully transparent? How should it operate? You mentioned blockchain. 90% of all conversations involving blockchain are non-consensual. Um, but what does a collecting society look like if, it, if, if you know how they're sampling, you know what the data that they get when they sample is, what does... Uh, what does a fair apportionment as between composers and the various performers on a track, as well as anyone whose material they sample, look like? Right? What is that formula? Um, how do you identify rights holders for work that are orphans or whose uh, whose rights are in contention? What does a rigorous statistical sampling method look like? Statistics are an incredible tool for extrapolating from known data to the unknown world that you weren't able to sample. But it's so easy to do wrong. All of those questions are hard questions to answer. And it's the kind of thing that you can imagine scholars studying. It's the kind of thing you can imagine having panels on at industry conventions once those start again. Uh, it's the kind of thing that you could imagine going through the existing literature. So, you know, for example, sampling in music is something that's not, not sampling songs, but doing statistical sampling for, for royalty payments is a well understood phenomenon. And then we need a, a legislative uh, angle. And I think that that's inevitable because the copyright directive in the EU was a catastrophe. Um, when that all happens, we will have a choice. We can be the old lady who swallow the fly. We can swallow a spider to catch the fly, right? Try and make the, try and double down on the copyright directive, do more of what wasn't working and see if it works if we do it a bit harder. Or we can change our approach. So I think there will be a moment in our not too distant future where the catastrophic foolishness of the copyright directive is thrown into stark relief and everybody wants to do something about it. And that will be a moment, I think, for legislation. Mm. Fascinating. So, Cory Dottero, thank you ever so much for joining us.